Welcome to the North New South Wales Sabbath School Commentary. My name is Lawson Walters and I'm, a, I'm here on behalf of the North New South Wales Conference to bring you guys a reflection on what we see in lesson number six of this quarter's Sabbath School um, lesson. I am really, really excited to do it. I am just uh, loving this uh, quarter Sabbath School and I'm particularly loving the topic that I get to share on, which is why should we or why is interpretation, as it's comically named, but why should we interpret the Bible? Uh, before we get into it, I just, yeah, a little bit about myself. My name's Lawson. Um, I am currently a first-year um, theology student at Avondale College. Before that, I was a Bible worker for the North New South Wales Conference uh, for a number of years in volunteer and full-time capacities. I've done a bunch of work on radio, and I am... Yeah, just loving life. Um, coronavirus lockdown is epic. Uh, it's really cool that we get to do these Sabbath school commentaries, and I think that a lot of people are engaging with them as, uh, you know, as we are in lockdown because of the coronavirus. Even though coronavirus is not a good thing, I, I think it's it's helping to really make us more spiritual as people, and it's giving us essentially more time to jump into the Word, which is what we're going to be talking about today. Why? Why? Why should we interpret the Bible? I think this in topic is incredibly important because whether we realize it or not, we are constantly interpreting the Bible. We are constantly engaging in theology. And I'm going to be using those two terms rather interchangeably, engaging in theology and interpreting the Bible, because really they mean one of the same. Um, God is the I mean, the Bible is one of the primary resources of our understanding of the the Christian God. And so, therefore, whenever we talk about God, whenever we read the Bible, we are engaging in theology. We're coming to an understanding for ourselves, um, and we are, yeah, interpreting. The word theology means um, a word about God, and that's essentially, you know, because the, the word in theology in Greek, um, you know, logos means word. Theos, meaning God, a word about God. So whenever we are just talking or thinking about God, we are interpreting the Bible and engaging in theology. And when now we, we do that, um, even, you know, whether we're ignorant of it or not. And now I think it's just important to get down to, okay, why is in is it important? As I said, we are constantly doing, but why is why does that have an, an effect on that us? Why is it important? Well, simply this. Um, it is important to interpret the Bible for two main reasons. Firstly, for ourselves, and secondly, for the sake of others. We're going to deal with ourselves first because uh, we're, we're selfish people, and then we're going to jump into why um, we engage in theology and study the Bible for others. Now, um, firstly, dealing with ourselves, simply our engagement of theology is incredibly informing to our lives. Um, I have this quote here from author Kelly Capick um, in the book, A Little Book for New Theologians, Why and How to Study Theology in the Bible, uh, and this this quote says, Our concepts about the divine inform our lives more deeply than most people can trace. Whether we view God as distant or near, as gracious or capricious, as concerned or apathetic, the conclusions that we reach, whether the result of careful reflection or negligent assumptions, guide our lives. This is a huge statement. It gives us a lot of insight. Um, essentially, we are people of perspective. We all have worldviews that are informed um, by the choices that we make, uh, by our ex experience, and, and our worldview informs the choices that we make. But we all have a worldview that's informed by our experiences in life, our beliefs, what we know to be true, and what we know to be false. And that manifests itself into the choices that we make. And now, if our faith and our understanding of God has a huge part, as you can imagine, with God being such a grand and absolutionist kind of topic, it would just naturally have such an effect on what we believe. And we have to come to the conclusion that, yeah, we are quite narrow and myopic as people. And so that is a huge, 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 huge 
the motivation to study the Bible and come to an interpretation of the Bible. Because without the Bible, look, we're just up to doing our own thing. We're just up to just following our own ways um, and essentially getting lost. I have another quote here from Capic's book. It says, Do we want to worship Yahweh or waste time and effort on a deity that we have constructed in our own mind? Not only is it important to study theology from the perspective of, oh, hey, we want to do the right thing, but also we should be focused on the subject of theology and the subject of biblical interpretation, which is God. How do we want to relate to God? How do we want to treat God? Well, that will be informed by our picture of God. I wanted to use a biblical example um, and actually a kind of negative one we're going to start with of what it looks like to misinterpret the Bible, to just um, interpret the Bible based on your own conclusions, to unfaithfully um, engage in theology um, and to be a person who, yeah, just doesn't do the right thing based on the fact that they are not engaging with the Bible correctly. Um, not only correctly, but they're just not doing the best they can because they, they don't want to. And the biblical example that I came to is the example and the story of King Saul. Now, your boy, King Saul, first king of Israel, he's appointed king after um, the nation of Israel comes together and they're like, hey, look, we want a king. We don't want a judge anymore. We, we are sick of this succession of judges and we don't want God to be our ultimate king. So look... Just give us, give us a human king. Samuel is incredibly displeased by this, but um, being the Bible student he is, he recognizes that that uh, even God makes provision for this in the book of Deuteronomy. God is so funny and clear. He's just like, look, children of Israel, because of their iniquities, they're going to want a king, and here is the provisions for granting them a king. Because of their iniquities, um, they come to the conclusion that they want a king. And Samuel's like, look, I knew this was going to happen, so I will get you a king. He anoints King Saul. Uh, he anoints Saul to be the king of Israel. And King Saul, he rules Israel for a number of years before this happens. Uh, before we get into the the real reading that we're going to be unpacking, which is in um, 1 Samuel chapter 13. Before we jump into it, something that's important to understand about the king of Israel, one of the provisions made in the book of Deuteronomy, is that the king of Israel was to be given a book of the law, or a book of the, you know, the Torah, and they were to study it every day of their life and to keep it on them at all times. They're essentially charged um, by the priests and by God with being incredibly studious of the Bible. And that should be something that we, we should strive to do. And that's because they were the king of the nation that was tasked with representing God. Because of this, uh, Saul is given a book of the Bible at the start of his, his reign. And he, again, a task with coming to a, an awesome, you know, a complete understanding of the Bible, um, to continually study it day or night to help him as he endeavors to guide the nation of Israel. And we get the sense as we read the, you know, the chapters before chapter 13, we get the sense that Paul, I mean, Saul, sorry, isn't incredibly faithful in studying the Bible. He doesn't put it into high regard. And that ultimately brings us to chapter 13, where Saul um, gathers together a bunch of dudes and they attack the Philistines in a number of places. He sends his son, um, Jonathan, with a legion of men to attack a garrison. And it turns to pot. It doesn't work out. And um, the nation of Israel is incredibly scared uh, to the point where the Bible says, and the men of Israel saw that they're in danger. This is First Samuel chapter 13, verse 6. When the men of Israel saw that they were in danger, for the people were distressed, then the people hid in caves, in thickets, in rocks, in holes, and in pits. And some of the Hebrews crossed over the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. As for Saul, he was still in Gilgal, and all the people followed him trembling. Then he waited seven days according to the time set by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. So Saul said, Bring a burnt offering and, and 
peace offerings here to me. And he offered the burnt offering. Now, essentially what's going on, Saul's chilling. He's, but he's very scared. Everyone's in Israel, very scared. They're very scared of the Philistines. They realize they're in danger. They realize they're susceptible to attack. So they're all hiding. And in this time, Saul is waiting for Samuel to come so that they can do offering. But Samuel doesn't show up in the time that Saul expects him to. So what Saul does is he says, you know what, like, I'm going to do the offering myself. I'm the king of Israel. I can do this. Um, So he gives a burnt offering and a peace offering to the Lord. It's kind of easy to see how he comes to this conclusion. He's like, look, I'm the king. I'm going to do this offering. Maybe, you know, he... He read the story in Genesis where Abraham, who was not considered a, he was considered the father of the faith, but he wasn't considered a a priest. He gave to the Lord. So, you know, he did burn offering to the Lord in the story of the binding of Isaac. Why can't I? And so that's what he does. And he thinks it's okay. Um, Until Samuel shows up and Samuel says, what have you done? Saul said, When I saw that the people were scattered from me and that you did not come within the days appointed and that the Philistines gathered together in mishmash, then I said, the Philistines will now come down on me at Gilgal and I have not made supplication to the Lord. Therefore, I felt compelled and offered a burnt offering. So Saul says, he shares his motivation. He's like, oh, look, I needed to make supplication for myself. Um, I was scared that the, the, the Philistines are going to rock up and destroy me. So that's what I did. And this is just an absolute no, no. We know from, I, I believe it's the book of Leviticus where basically no one is committed to do burnt offering except for the priests. Um, and there's uh, maybe a couple of reasons for that. The firstly being that it's just simply protocol and that the priests know how to do the burnt offering. But secondarily to that, I think, you know, if we start to interpret the Bible here, if we start to do a little bit of theology, I think that this is really representing someone who is trying to offer a sacrifice of themselves. They're trying to say, hey, look, look at this sacrifice that I did for myself that makes me look okay with God, that, that, that makes me good with God because I did this thing. It's essentially, Saul is engaging in salvation by works. And now Samuel rocks up and he's like, Saul, this is not okay. And for you as the king who has one of the only copies of the Torah on them, who is tasked to continually read through it and come to a full understanding of it, or, you know, to a continual dynamic understanding is supposed to be engrossed in the word of God so that you can lead your people better. You have sinned. You have done the wrong thing. And this will not be tolerated by God. This has revealed your character as someone who is just not willing to to give up their own precepts about God, um, who does things willy-nilly because they have come to their own conclusions rather than really searching the scripture and coming to a biblical conclusion. And because of that, he says um, in verse 13, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the commandments of the Lord, your God, which he commanded you. For now the Lord would have established your kingdom forever but now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be a commander over his people because you have not kept the, the what the Lord commanded you. Ouch. Oh, man, that hurts to read. Imagine, imagine. This is just, it's so sucky. God is just like, look, man. Oh, Samuel is like, look, man, on behalf of God, you've done the complete wrong thing. Therefore, your kingdom will not continue. You will not be the lineage of the kingdom. That's it for you. We're, like God has already sought out a person after his own heart, a person who is studying to strive to get to know him better through the study of the scriptures, which you were tasked to do. And because you didn't do it, you did the wrong thing. And the kingdom stripped from you. Tough luck. Rough gig. Essentially, as I mentioned before in the quote, um, which said that, you know, um, do we want to worship a deity, uh, worship Yahweh or waste time worshiping a deity constructed in our own image? That's exactly what Saul had done. And that's exactly what Saul had engaged in. And and because of that, um, he led the people of God astray. 
um, and his personal relationship with, with God was just not in the right place, and he was seen to not be fit to lead the kingdom of God. This should really inspire us to engage in biblical interpretation, to read the Bible and to study the Bible and to interpret for ourselves. Interpretation of the Bible is not limited to the vacuum of scholasticism. As we said before, theology has an, you know, our, our understanding of theology has an incredibly large effect on our own lives. Therefore, we should be continually studying the Bible um, to be to be jumping into the word and to be coming to interpretations. I think that, you know, there are a number of principles to that that we're not going to really jump into today. You know, studying the Bible in unity with one another, we can really benefit by the insights of our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. But really, we need to realize that our relationship with God is one that has a personal nature. We are not corporately saved. We are not saved by subscribing to the words of Doug Batchelor, David Ashrick, you know, my theology lecturers, as insightful as they are, I need to come to my own conclusion. I need to work out my own salvation to the Lord. And I can really only do that if I am studying his word faithfully, coming to the point where I, I say, look, God, I am subservient to scripture. I'm humbling myself before you. And I want to know you better through your word. So I can worship you correctly. Again, one of the big motivations to study theology is because we want to be right. We want to be correct. We, we want to know that what we're doing is true. And we don't want to waste our time worshiping some, a, a God that we've constructed in our own mind, which Saul did. And we know the event, dude, like this was a fruit of what was to come for Saul because eventually like guy committed suicide. I really, I see that. And as someone who's struggled with depression myself personally, like I, I, I see suicide, it's the ultimate defeat. It's the ultimate, like, you know, the, your perspective, you become so blinded by your pride or sadness that you can't see God as loving and forgiving um, from, at least from a theological standpoint. And that's exactly how Saul ends up. And that all started with, with that he wasn't committed to, studying the Bible, um, in coming to a correct interpretation, following it, and uh, in, ob in obeying it. We now contrast that with King David. Psalms, we read in Psalm 119, uh, those who know this psalm would know well the topic of this psalm. It's essentially this giant, big, long reflection on the Word of God, on the law of God. Um, I love how he David says, you are my portion, O Lord. I have said that I would keep your words. He makes it very clear that the word of God, that was uh, Psalm 119 and verse 37. Um, essentially, David is saying, look, God, like your word is my, is, is my portion. And I will keep it. Like that is the thing that is sustaining me is is engaging in the study of your word, loving your word. He says in Psalm 119, verse 89, Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. I love this view of the word of God. It says that it's settled in heaven. It's firm in heaven. It's perfect and strong in a perfect place, being heaven. This is awesome because it is, it is a beautiful and heavy contrast to us. It's like we are not settled. We are messed up in sin. We are like screwed up human beings that we're incredibly narrow and myopic and we are full of presuppositions and false interpretations. And David clearly says here, like your word is settled in heaven. That should inspire us to jump into the word, to interpret the word, to come to a conclusion of the word. What does this mean to me and my life and how can my life change because of it. Someone who was constantly doing this was, oh man, your boy Daniel. We're going to flick over to Daniel chapter 9. And this is such um, an incredibly insightful passage of scripture. Daniel chapter 9, the Bible says, in the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the lineage of the Medes, Medes, who was the king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, 
understood the books by the books the number of years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. So this is so, so, so awesome. Um, basically, Daniel, a prophet of the, of the Lord, our, our guy, like I'm a Seventh-day Adventist and I just know for a fact, like, our, you know, our doctrines, our understandings um, are built on the entire Bible. But when it comes to our eschatology, you know, historically, Daniel has just been such an influence for us and has really informed our interpretation of the second coming and of really world history. Like, Daniel's the man, really. Daniel is the man. Again, especially as Adventists, uh, Daniel chapter 8 verse 14 has set us apart as a movement and has inspired us as a remnant people to to the truth, to correct interpretation. So, yeah, Daniel's the guy, right? Daniel's the guy. He's dropping knowledge. He is awesome. Um, and even him, in his old age at this point, mind you, is continually studying the Bible. And he's one day, he's studying the Bible, and he understands, basically, a prophecy by Jeremiah um, about the accomplishment of the seven years, seven years of the desolations of Jerusalem. Because of his Bible study, he comes to the conclusion that, hey, Jerusalem is supposed to be built, you know, starting to be restored after 70 years. Why isn't that happening? This leads him to then pray to God earnestly. He studies the Bible, leads him to pray to God earnestly, like, God, we need to make this happen. I've come to a conclusion from your word. I've interpreted correctly what Jeremiah was talking about. He prays to God. He repents for the sins, not only for himself, but of the nation. And in turn, God gives him the single most important prophecy about Christ in the Bible. The most prolific Christological Old Testament prophecy, the Daniel chapter 9 prophecy, the 70 weeks prophecy that is so incredible. It's a staple. Um, you know, not only was it really informative for Daniel and his time um, and to the people of Israel as to when Jesus would come and when the Messiah would come, but it is a staple through and through of prophecy seminars today because it is so convincing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and he was supernaturally foretold to have come. That is amazing. And that all came on the back of Daniel studying his Bible. And he was incredibly blessed by the Lord because of it. Man, if, if, that, doesn't, if that doesn't inspire you to study the Bible, oh, I don't know what would. Because not only as we've shared here, it's incredibly motivating and, and beneficial to us because we know that we're studying the right God. But when we study the Bible, as was the case for Daniel, it had incredible influence on the world, on many people, on an entire, on multitudes and multitudes of people who fall down before Daniel in heaven and say, wow, like your prophecies changed my life. And now I want to turn to a last verse. Um, one of the last passages we're going to be considering in the book of Second Peter, I believe. I mean, no, First Peter, sorry. Um, hold on, I'm just, I'm just uh, turning there. We're going to be reading, I believe, First Peter chapter 2. Yes, First Peter chapter 2. Starting in verse 4, we're kind of bringing all things together here. The Bible says um, in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4, Coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to, G um, acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, this is verse 6 now, it is also contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious, but to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become a chief cornerstone, and this, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. 
they stumble being disobedient to the word to which they also were appointed. Notice that there, to which they also were appointed. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who call you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Powerful stuff right there. Verse 10, who, one, who once were not a people, but are now a people of God, who had obtained mercy, but now, who had not obtained mercy, sorry, but now have obtained mercy. This is a super awesome passage of scripture because what it is essentially saying is that we are all called to communicate the Bible. And it does that in this way. It calls us a royal priesthood and it calls us that because it says that we are called out of darkness into his marvelous light. There's two really important um, types there, two really important um, metaphors and symbols that I just want to get in and discuss. The first one being this idea of, of being a royal priesthood. Now, in the times of ancient Israel, in the time, for example, of King Saul, there was only a couple, you know, uh, version, a couple copies of the Bible available to read. One was owned by the king, as we mentioned before, and the other was owned by the priests. And essentially what the priest's role was with their copy of the Bible was to read it, to read it aloud, to lead and guide their people um, with the word of the Lord. In fact, it was one of the festivals, one of the, the celebratory um, feasts was this coming together to read the word of God as, as a mechanism to lead God's, God's people. Now, we see this really awesome thing happen in the book of Nehemiah, where for the first time in hundreds of years, in fact, the Bible says since the time of Joshua, they come together to read um, the Torah, to read the word of God. Again, this is the first time in ages, and this is after they've been after, uh, under, you know, um, they've been through the captivity and they've been under incredibly supreme hardship. They come together, they're reading the word of God, the priests are up the front reading the word of God to the people, and the people are weeping and crying and repenting, and they're falling down before the Lord, and they're, they're giving their lives to him. It's really awesome how they celebrate after that, and the priests are like, hey, get up, guys, let's celebrate, because now we know God better, and that's as a result of reading his word and getting to know him. What it also says is we become this royal priesthood because we are called out of darkness into his marvelous light. When I hear language like that, my mind immediately goes to John chapter 1. Um, I'm open there now. John chapter 1 verse 1, the Bible says, classic passage. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and without him, nothing was made that was made nothing, uh, I mean, sorry, in him was life, and that life was the light of man, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Powerful passage. I love what this passage does. Um, in Essentially, it does this word, work of, of distilling and, and funneling big abstract concepts into something that we can understand. It starts off with, in the beginning was the word. The word used here, as I mentioned before, is the word logos. The word logos has a few different meanings, but in this context, I believe it's referring to logos as the complete knowledge and understanding in its totality, knowledge and understanding in its completeness. And it says in that, the complete knowledge and understanding it was with God and associated with God because it was God. The word was God. All of knowledge and understanding was manifested in God. And he was in the beginning with God um, and all things were made through him. The totality of knowledge and understanding created, and we know that he created us as God. In him was life and that life was the light of Men. Now, this is where we get back to what is earlier. Essentially, it says that we um, we become a royal priesthood when we are called out of light, out of darkness into His marvelous light. And this is describing here the Word, which is the totality of knowledge and understanding, which is the Word, which is also Jesus. I'm not going to deep dive too far into that, but it's described as light. 
essentially what I believe this to be saying is that when we take God's word, when we read it, when we associate with it, we, when we try to understand more of, about God through the word of God, which is a manifestation of himself, which is a man, the word of God is described in the Bible as a manifestation of Jesus. When we do that, we come closer to God and we become this royal priesthood and we fulfill our calling of sharing the word with the world. That's so awesome. And that's exactly what I want to do. And that's what this um, thing is compelling me in, in coming to, a, uh, sorry, this study is compelling me to do in coming to an understanding of God and who he is um, through reading the word, interpreting the word and, and, and getting down to the, to the nitty gritty of what it means to us personally. We are then compelled to go and share that with others to be a blessing to them. And that's, and that's really awesome. Um, uh-huh. And, th- and that's just the thing, like, we would just not be here without people engaging in theology and engaging in, in trying to interpret the Bible. One of the best, best examples of that is our forefathers in of, of our faith in particular, of Seventh-day Adventism, a bunch of, a bunch of nobodies, you know, really think about it. Who was Hiram Edson? Who was William Miller? Who was Joseph Bates? Who was James and Ellen White? Just a bunch of faithful people who wanted to know God and be close to him. And because of that, they started a movement that God has used to change so many lives in our day um, around the world. I know it's changed my lives. And I think to close out, I just want to share my, I guess, my own personal story of my encounter with the word and how it's changed my life. Um, I didn't grow up Christian. I grew up in a secular home. Um, and when I was 17 years old, I was invited by a group of friends to go and hang out. It was, it was really cool. I was like, yep, yeah, cool. I'll hang out with you. But the night before I got really, really drunk and I was incredibly hungover. I had a gnarly headache. And I didn't know if I wanted to hang out, but I saw this text in my phone that was illuminated. It was like, hey man, come and, come and get food with us. Uh, come, and, come and hang out at this person's place and get food. And I was like, look, I need food. I need sustenance. I'm dying. I'll go and eat food because they are offering me food and I need it to fix my hangover. I rock up to this house and sit down and it turns out to be the Seeds House Church. And what I wasn't expecting was to sit in a circle with people and then start singing a cappella hymns as my head is pounding and my brain is falling out of my mouth. Now, this is a terrible situation and I was hating it because I was so hungover and I really had the thought like, man, I should just get up and leave. Like, who cares? What do I owe these people? But then the Holy Spirit convicted me, it pricked my heart and I was like, look, I should stay around and listen to what these people have to say. They're my friends. They treat me really nice. They love on me a lot. You know, let, let's see what they have to say. And um, I sat there while a Bible study was led out by Joseph Scaff about a character in the Bible named Mephibosheth. Now, Mephibosheth is the grandson of Saul, the son of Jonathan. And by the time he kind of comes on the scene, um, the big switch is happening. Saul uh, has has um, has died and David is taking over the kingdom and common practice back in, you know, the times of the, the ancient world, back in the times of ancient Israel is that if a new, new king took over a kingdom, the common practice was to kill everyone from the old lineage because it essentially was like a mutiny. Um, this was the common practice of the time. And that's what you're expecting to happen as you read the story, especially because not only is Mephibosheth, He's in the line of the wrong king. He's also a social outcast. He's lame in the legs. He can't walk. The guy is just messed up in every way. And it's like, oh, well, rip, I guess. Like, that, that's it for this dude. He, he's gone. But Joseph, he studied this passage about this Mephibosheth guy who we don't even see very often. And he saw a really cool comparison there. He was like, you know what? The same way that David takes Mephibosheth in, Christ takes us in, even though Mephibosheth doesn't deserve it, even though there's no reason for David to, David takes him in and treats him as one of his sons. That's what Christ does for us. 
He shared that in a Bible study with us. And honestly, me sitting there as a 17-year-old kid, struggling with depression, struggling with alcoholism, struggling with this feeling of implicit failure in life, feeling like, oh man, I'm not good enough. I'm sitting there listening to this story about Mephibosheth, how he was taken in by David. And then when he pointed that to us and said, look, that's the same way as Christ takes us in. At that moment, I knew that I wanted to get to know more about God and that and my life was changed. I gave my heart to Jesus and uh, that was, you know, some four years ago now in 2016 and, and look where I am now. I'm studying theology and leading out a Sabbath school commentary. Praise the Lord, right? But that all came on the back of Joseph Scaff, your boy, just, you know, a pastor here in the North New South Wales Conference, a believer like you and I, he just studied his Bible and was like, wow, this is really cool. I'm going to share this with a bunch of people and it changed my life. Think about your own life. Think about, you know, you having the ability to, to read the word of God, to study the Bible. Man, I have like four Bibles at home. I'm incredibly privileged. We're incredibly privileged. The opportunity that you have to read and study the Bible and come to a cool conclusion. And imagine, imagine, you know, you get to heaven and you see that like that one day when you shared a devotional thought, um, you know, with a friend via a text message, maybe you come to a cool, cool conclusion in the Bible. You're like, you know, I'm going to send that to my friend because I think it's really cool. And you see that that was exactly what your friend needed to hear in order to be saved. Like, hey, man, like, you just have no idea. And that's how powerful the Word of God is. And that is the benefit of Bible study. That's the benefit of interpreting the Bible. And that's, that's stuff that changes lives right there. I don't really have much more to say other than that. Look, guys, I'm just really appealing to you as, as a motivational speaker, I guess. Look, please study the Bible. Undertake the work of, of interpreting it coming to conclusions for yourself and then using that to be a blessing and a benefit to others. I know I I just don't have the time to get into principles of that. That's for another, the how is for another day, but I would just encourage you and to motivate you um, to just get into it because of how good and amazing the word of God is and how good and amazing God is and his and your obligation um, and and, your obligation to him as a believer and, and the calling that he has for your life to all of us, to be studious of the word and to interpret it faithfully, to be a blessing. Thanks, guys, a lot. Uh, Have a fantastic day. In Jesus' name, amen.